voice. We are happy to have you join us and I hope you are good. So it's a good morning, it's a good afternoon, it's a good evening from wherever you are joining us from. And I hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are because it's really beautiful out there in Yaba, the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital in Yaba, Lagos. It's beautiful, it's sunny, the atmosphere is lovely. And so we are happy to welcome you to this webinar. And again, it's the month of March. March is the best month in the year. Don't ask me why, but it's one of the most unique months in the year, very special and really, really unique. Um, today promises to be really exciting educative, um, informative, and I hope you will go home better informed um, at the end of today's webinar. Um, to welcome us formally to this platform um, is the medical director, as well as the hour head of the Yabo Voice, um, is the medical director and our head of the Yabo Voice. And I am happy to tell you that um, the medical director has made this um, really, really wonderful for us in terms of yeah, being able to reach out, being able to you know, talk to people and to ensure that um, we get information out there for as many people. And that's why it's been sustained uh, for this length of time. Uh, please, I want you to um, just think, chat, Call on someone now um, let them understand that the Yabo Voice webinar for the month of March is on. And like I said, we're looking at something very interesting. We're looking at anxiety, normal to abnormal. Um, yeah, people will tell you, I, I'm, I'm very anxious. I, I tend to be very anxious. Why are they anxious? What is it? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Uh, this is some of the things that we hope to be able to um, to explore today. And coupled with the fact that so many things are out there ranging in our world, I will tell you a lot of us are really anxious. So really, really anxious because uh, the times are really, really difficult. And it's bringing on all of those things. And that's why we're looking at it. This of is looking at how to be able to met up, manage it, um, able to improve our mental functioning and so that we can be able to adequately function and move on um, in life. And that's why we are here on this platform. So please, you could tell anyone to join us um, on this platform, send the, um, the link to them. Um, if they are not able to connect with us on this platform, please, they could also join us on the Facebook page of the Yabba Voice, um, Yabba Voice One Word, and they could join us there. And then they would be viewing this live and direct as we will be talking about this important um, topic of discussion um, today, anxiety from normal to abnormal. When do you leave the range of normal? When does it become a problem? These are things that we will definitely explore today so that we can become you know, better managers of our health and they will be able to function um, as adequately as, uh, as possible. Um, like I said, March is a beautiful month. And maybe that's why we're looking at it so that we can become better individuals. Uh, March is um, a month. And let me just sit there. March is, um, no. Very, very, very special. All right, so the medical director will be addressing us shortly and welcoming us to um, this platform uh, for today's um, webinar. Um, just a bit of technical each here and there. You know, you can't just get a hang on some of those things perfectly. And that's part of what we'll be talking about too today. You know, sometimes when it gets out of control, sometimes we tend to get very anxious, but our ability to be able to manage it is what also takes us out. And these are some of the things we'll be talking about today. You know, even when, there is a tension. How can I manage it and be able to move on? All right, over to you, the medical director, um, Dr. Olivia, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, all over the world. I welcome you to today's edition of our regular webinar by Yaba Voice on mental health issues. As you all know, Yaba Voice is a platform for mental health education, advocacy, and community outreach. It is a platform of Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Yaba Lagos, through which the hospital creates awareness and educates the populace on topical mental health issues. Today's topic is anxiety from normal to abnormal. As we all know, anxiety is an intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. 
this can be normal in stressful situations such as public speaking, taking a test, or writing exams. However, anxiety is only an indicator of underlying disease when feelings become excessive, persistent, all consuming and interfere with the daily living of an individual. In today's webinar, many questions will be answered. For example, what do we understand by anxiety? When is it normal? When is it abnormal? What are the factors responsible for anxiety in an individual? How does anxiety manifest? What are the available treatment strategies and preventive measures? In today's webinar, we have renowned mental health professionals to address this issue. First on the list is Dr. Yuwande Osoji. Dr. Yuwande Osoji is a consultant psychiatrist and a senior lecturer at the Department of Psychiatry, Lagos University Teaching Hospital and College of Medicine, University of Lagos, respectively. Dr. Shodi had a basic medical undergraduate training from the prestigious College of Medicine, University of Lagos, and postgraduate training at the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. She obtained a subspecialty training in child and adolescent psychiatry from South Africa. She holds Masters in Public Health from the University of Lagos and Masters in Philosophy from the Selembot University, South Africa. Dr. Oshodi is a researcher. She's a trainer and has over 40 peer review articles in both local and inter international journals. Currently, she functions in top management capacity at Lagos University in Hospital. Uh, in the Diarapa. Dr. Oshodi led the Lagos State COVID-19 psychosocial intervention team during the first and second wave of COVID-19. He's a member of several psychiatric and allied professionals, and she's a mental health advocate. She's married with children. The second speaker is Mr. Akin Gibre. Akin Gabriel is a licensed clinical psychologist with over 20 years experience in federal neuropsychiatric hospital in Japan, Lagos. He obtained his first degree from the University of Nigeria, Nsuka, and master's in clinical psychology from the University of Lagos. Currently, Akin is a doctoral student at the prestigious University of Ibadan. As a clinical psychologist, his major areas of interest are in the area of clinical evaluation, psychometrics, psychotherapy, research, and training. He has worked with diverse populations in clinical settings, including children and adolescents. Also, Mr. King Gabriel is married with children. Kindly relax and listen to our mental health expert as we promise you a rewarding session of today's webinar. Thank you, and over to you, this is our Thank you so very much, the medical director. Um, you can see the medical director had introduced the topic for today. He had given us brief into, yes, what is anxiety? But then again, our speakers are here to really dig deep, deep into this issue of anxiety. You know, sometimes people would want to do a presentation and the next thing is you would discover that the paper would develop wings and we start shaking and they will start vibrating. And you know, a lot of all of those things. And these are some of the things that we want to deal with today. And I was telling somebody as I was going home yesterday, walking down the street of Yaba, I said, any park car, I don't want to walk beside. I prefer to walk in the middle of the road. Now, when I hear a horn, I will move. Because you can't even know what's going on there. It's not the anxious, anxiety, and the tension. It's just so, so very much. Well, our speakers are here. Please remember, you can log on to the Facebook page of Yabu Voice and join us as we commence on this webinar today. And please, you can send your comments and questions to the chat box. We would be willing to hear from you and also to be able to answer your question. All right, so quickly, we're going into the discussion. Dr. Yewande, should you get up? 
afternoon, Ma. Good to see your beautiful face once again. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, MD, for that introduction. Thank you very much, Yaba Voice, for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. Good day, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, all right, so Dr. Yewande Oshodi will be talking to us on what is anxiety. Um, is anxiety always a bad thing? And how do we move from normal to abnormal? Yes, what is normal? What is abnormal? So how do we mm -hmm. move? What are those things that you would know that, oh, I am not operating a normal level? She's going to expound our understanding um, this afternoon. Over to you, Dr. Yewande Oshodi. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for starting on that note. I think it's very important that we all remind ourselves, whether we're you know, regular people in the community or we're medical practitioners or health workers, what exactly is this thing called anxiety? Anxiety is really a normal emotion. When we talk about emotional states, we go through, we have different emotional states that we've experienced at different times, you know, being happy, being sad, being worried, being anxious is a normal emotional state. It actually um, refers to the response, you know, of the brain to danger, to what the brain perceives as a dangerous or a potentially dangerous situation or stimuli that we as um, persons, we want to actively, you know, attempt to avoid or uh, get away from. And this um, brain response, you know, is all, it's been there from when we were infants, literally, and it shows up in different ways. Like I said, it's a normal emotion. And really it's on a kind of continuum. It can be from mild, you know, expression of anxiety to even severe expressions of anxiety. Unfortunately, there are times when what is termed as normal is now a bit more than is expected for that situation. That is when we start talking about anxiety disorders. Well, let's just backtrack a little bit and think about historically our, our historical cavemen, you know, in when we look at pre I mean, historical times when they were in caves and they were having to chase wild animals they needed this they utilized this normal response to danger to save themselves you know to run away from predators to run away from dangerous situations and as we've developed you know even though we've become you know more westernized and civilized and all that we still have that instinctual response that's why i said it's normal to want to escape from dangerous situations. Indeed, this reaction, you know, stimulates what is known as, you know, a stress reaction, you know, in us. That trigger causes a rush of some hormones, some chemicals known as adrenaline. That's what makes us react in certain ways when we're anxious. Remember, I'm still talking about normal anxiety. We, we experience our hearts beating fast, we start sweating, our hands become sweaty, and we want to get away from that situation. And I'm sure every single person on this call can think about that one incident where you actually felt anxious. Either you're standing in front of you know, a crowd or you are having to prepare for that exam or Dr. Shodi has to prepare for this talk this afternoon. I did experience some anxious symptoms in me. These are normal things and anxiety can actually assist us to at times perform well. But when we have persistence of this reaction, either in excess of what's the trigger is, or it continues, you know, in spite of the absence of that trigger, then we should begin to wonder, could this be an anxiety um, disorder? I just want to add one more thing, you know, before I return back to you that, you know, um, there are age appropriate responses, anxious responses. What I'm trying to say is that there are certain responses that are absolutely normal for certain age ranges. You know, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I would do wrong without elaborating a bit on children and adolescents. For example, there are what we call normative responses. That's normal responses, anxiety responses in children. An infant, for example, will have a startle response to sound, loud sounds, or, you know, such a slam of the door. That is normal. I wouldn't expect a 30-year-old to have that kind of um, response. Or um, a younger child could have what we know as separation anxiety. At that age, it's absolutely normal. Between 12 months and 18 months, they want, they feel afraid when they're separated from their caregiver. Another one or two other normal responses for children will be the fear of lightning and thunder in you know, children that are maybe around two to four years of age. They're afraid of animals, cats, they scream and they shout. It's not a disorder. That is absolutely normal anxiety 
on a teenager who is a bit worried about what would my peers think about me? This is normative anxiety. But then we would need to be, then be aware that when these things, these anxious responses that I've said are normal, persist in spite of the basic triggers that we, we, we say are acceptable, or they, out, they outstrip the trigger that is causing this response in the individual, then we may be dealing with an anxiety disorder. Um, I'll, I'll just stop there so that we can you know, further elaborate on other questions. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is going on so well. And, and I can remember, you know, those days, Dr. Shodi, when they would talk about monsters under the bed. Exactly. Your mind, your mind will begin to imagine, even in a so dark five to seven year that, old yes. can mm -hmm. say they're monsters under my bed. That's because at that age, they use a lot of fantasy thinking. Their imagination mm -hmm. is very rich. So it's normal for them. But when I see a 15 year old monsters under my bed, I can't sleep, I'm really afraid, an adult experiencing that, it may be an anxiety disorder or something else that needs to be further evaluated. Oh, yes. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Thank, thank you so very much, ma'am. We're we'll, we'll still coming back to you. Uh, and now we'll be going over to um, speak um, to um, Mr. Akin Gabriel. And what you will be talking about is how do we know that we are actually experiencing anxiety? Um, how do I know that what I'm going through is, you know, people, I, I once had a client who said, I ran from my house to the hospital. It's like my heart wanted to come out. And you can imagine when somebody's heart wants to come out and she's still running. You know, I, said, I, I ran. How do I know that what I'm actually experiencing is anxiety, you know, in, in whatever it is, whether in the normal, whether in the abnormal firms, or, 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 or like that? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Kemi, for that. Yeah, well, uh, you, the, the adults will keep running as long as the fear is still there, <laughs> undoubtedly. And that's why we are talking about anxiety. Thanks so much also, Dr. Shudi, for that introduction. And there's no doubt about it, anxiety can also have some very positive uses. In fact, uh, at, at times, your life could actually de uh, depend on the level of anxiety that you have. Yeah, but what are some, how do I know you have anxiety? How will you know you have anxiety? Perhaps we could also uh, start that by saying, uh, talking about some of the types of anxiety. Uh, maybe for some of us, we'll be surprised that there are types of anxiety. Anxiety is anxiety, but yeah. They are manifested in various forms, starting from the very, very specific to the general. For example, you have specific phobias. When somebody, when, when you have very, you know, un, un, can I say unrealistic or a destructive fear of a particular object or a particular situation, you know that this fear is unrealistic. It is totally in, 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 in disproportionate to the kind of uh, a situation that you find yourself, but you, it's like there's nothing that you can do about it, but it's also directed at a particular thing. Maybe for example, an animal or an insect. Um, well, some people have this uh, phobia for, uh, for cockroaches, for rats, snakes, and uh, you know, all the other stuff. So we have specific phobias with its own unique and peculiar uh, signs and symptoms. We also have social anxiety disorder, which is basically a fear of, 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 of uh, uh, you know, of losing control in the open. We are worried, we are concerned about losing control uh, uh, in, in situations where we find ourselves, for example, maybe in open places, maybe, uh, uh, you know, in, in an area where we, we believe that we won't be able to uh, uh, get some form of uh, uh, safety. In, you know, for example, maybe uh, uh, markets, malls, you know, uh, even in, within uh, taking a ride in a train or, uh, or even in a car, even under the bridges at times, some people have morbid anxieties, uh, uh, quite a lot of anxiety about uh, uh, driving as a result of the bridges and other things that we have around. So we have that as well. We also have panic disorders, which is for, for a lot of people, this is what they'll see as the anxiety. All that frequent attacks, the sudden intense episode that we have about anxiety and fear all rolled into one. It's like everything is going to end at that particular time. So we have panic disorders as well. We have uh, uh, agoraphobia. You know, there, there's that word, there's, there's, that, there's that fear, you know, about, about crowds, about open places, about big places. They're just afraid about stadium. 
you don't want to, you can, that person can't even go out to functions. There's, there's a, there are fears there, but you don't know what is causing the fear. And at the same time, you know that this fear is actually disproportionate. It is big, it's, it's bigger than what is supposed to be for that particular uh, thing. Then you also have the generalized now, now this is not talking about generalized, uh, uh, general anxiety, a generalized form of anxiety. Uh, the classical, uh, uh, the old description that we used to have for generalized anxiety so that then was a free floating fear, more or less like a fear without basis, yeah, a fear that doesn't have any uh, basis at all, you know, it, and it is more or less like something that has been chronic, something that has been going on for a very long time. It's generalized uncomfortable feelings, generalized uncomfortable worry. We're always worried. We're always worried about something. We're always thinking some negative outcomes about certain things. You know, all of these are some of the types of anxiety that we have. That's from specific phobias to that uh, uh, social anxiety disorders to uh, uh, panic attacks to uh, also, also generalized anxiety disorder. How do you know if you have uh, uh, anxiety? Doctor should mention that it's actually a response that we make, definitely. And it's actually manifested in about three or four dimensions in, in more or less like, like in our thoughts, in our beliefs. Then there's the emotional uh, uh, reaction as a result of that. Then there are some physiological uh, events that also take place that now manifest behaviorally, almost in that particular sequence. For example, uh, the, the child, well, maybe a 30 year old man may have a fear of, uh, oh, his exams are coming up. Oh, man, I, I know I'm going to fail that exam. Let's, that, just, that, that could just be the beginning of the whole thing. I'm not prepared for that exam. I'm going to fail that exam. And before I know it, the thoughts are started, it's negative thought, did not begin to now generate some uh, uh, form of anxiety, some fear, some worry. And all of this, it, it would just like release almost like a, a winding up physically of the anxiety reaction we just start. As the feelings are just building up, the, the physiological events are also happening. The better we begin to realize that, you know, the, 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 uh, a lot of things, the palpitations, you're going to have, uh, uh, you know, sweat, the person begin to sweat. Sweating now and other things are the behavioral manifestations. So you have all of this in, in, in like in a cycle like that. But generally what you know, uh, some of the time to, to, uh, that you see for somebody who have uh, anxiety, of course, are the, you know, the, the, the palpitation, the complaint of palpitation, the complaint of uh, pains in their stomach, for example, when they have maybe like generalized uh, pain in their stomach. Is it that maybe they are uh, going to toilet too much or they are not going enough? They are, they are trembling, you know, they, they, they are trembling. They can't sit still. The sweat is so much that you can see so many various designs on their shirts that they are wearing as a result of the sweat. They are breathing rapidly. The breathing is, uh, they are breathing rapidly, but at the same time, it's also shallow. They are not taking enough oxygen that they should take. They have this sense that something terrible is about to happen. They are, they are just afraid of that thing. And because their muscles are so tense, they are, uh, they are so much tension, they feel weak, they feel tired, some of them to the extent that they could hardly even walk. I've had uh, I've seen someone with an anxiety condition who had to go on a wheelchair because of the tiredness, because of the of the weakness. They have problems concentrating and thinking about anything. Uh, even at times, the, uh, at a particular time when, when they're about to write, either write the exam or recall everything, they just draw a blank. They just find out that they can't remember anything. Perhaps maybe some uh, people have found themselves in that situation behind the example. Suddenly they say, ah, my brain just went blank. You know, these are some of the signs of the anxiety that we're talking about. They have difficulty swallowing. They have difficulty even you know, controlling the worry. They are so agitated. They are so, you know, they're so worried about the whole thing. And at the same time, anything will actually trigger this particular uh, uh, situation. They, they find themselves all, always afraid. You know, they, they, they move around, they, have, they can't sleep very well, the appetite is also down, and they are generally in a state of, of, of total, what can I describe, like a wreck. They can't focus, they can't take in new information, they can't concentrate, they can't remember things, they can't recall things. And all at the same time, all of these things are going on. And there's that, for some people, especially in cases of panic attacks, there's that feeling that something dreadful will happen. One thing I would tell for somebody in the panic, that person was in a, an air-conditioned bus, and the person was trying to use her hands to, to, to pull apart the, 
the window so that she can go out through it, uh, through it because she was so much in, in the state of confusion, confusion and she was so afraid of something. And then we had to actually calm uh, uh, her down. There are quite a lot of them with, uh, which would want to but go along. We, we would talk more about them. Kevin. Thank you so very much. Um... Mr. King Gabriel, you know, when, when he started, he, he made a very profound statement, and that's the fact that your life can depend on the amount of anxiety that you might be experiencing, especially even now that we find yourself, you know, when, when you perceive that, oh, there is a threat of danger around, you know, being able to respond to that could also just uh, help to save your life. But you know, when he started really now, some of those ways you would know. I, I, I recall that there, there are times when I have gone blank in exam all, and you want to write and and you'll be there you'll be saying and and that that conjunction and a n d you will think and think and think and then you will just move on sometimes later it will just come come to you and no a lot of us have experienced some of this even seemingly mild and um, level of anxiety symptoms to the very, very huge one when you start having to go to the toilet you know, repeatedly. Your stomach will just you know, go a wire on its own without um, any, um, or just on faith. Uh, thank you so very much. But then I am going to ask you a question, maybe when we come back later, uh, to be able to, you were talking about phobias, and I know I have a very morbid phobia for something. I'm not going to mention it on this platform so that I will not be tagged and labeled. Um, I mean, you know, but then I have a very morbid, is it, is it okay to have your own phobia? You are managing it, you can cope. Your life is just moving on. No problem. As long as nobody just comes to you with that. Maybe when we come back to you, you'll be able to help me take that on. All right, but then Dr. Shodi, we're coming back to you and then want to look at, you know, um, Mr. Kike Brown has read out lots of symptoms um, and some of this type. But what are the causes, um, what are the triggers or maybe the risk factor for these anxieties? that we're, we're looking at what, what are those things that causes it yeah over to you please can you motor all right thank you okay. so very much all right thank you thank you very much for that question thank you mr aki gabriel for for you know elaborating further on these different um types of anxiety and anxiety disorders i think it's um it, it's important you know for our listeners to remember what i said at the beginning that when we talk about anxiety and anxiety disorders, it's somewhat a kind of continuum. So you have just anxiety symptoms, which are normal, we all experience it. For example, the, the, the anxiety experience in the classroom, it doesn't mean that that's an anxiety disorder per se, but then uh, of, um, the kind of generalized anxiety that he described where the person is just constantly afraid something is going to go wrong and they can't sleep, that's generalized anxiety, or you have a um, specific phobia that is really so hard to handle, then we may be dealing with anxiety disorders. I just thought it's important that we reiterate that so that um, people, as we are getting more aware, we're also um, not missing important things and also not labeling normal things as being disorders. So when we think about what the causes of anxiety disorders are, let me first of all highlight the causes of anxiety in our community. You know, like I said, it's a continuum. In our community of today, we all know our fears of insecurity. Am I safe? Have my doors been locked? You know, um, in my, my mega, is he a safe person? Should I sack him? If he looks at me funny, I should let him go. Maybe he wants to attack me. We're all a little bit more paranoid or fearful than usual because we've heard all sorts of stories. You know, for example, the other day I was in the car, my driver was taking me somewhere and he took a wrong turn. And I was like, where are you taking me to? I was afraid. Let him not kidnap me. You understand? Because we're in that um, environment. Now, but I won't say I have an anxiety disorder per se, but the environment is triggering a lot of anxiety response in me, in you, in all of us. You know, the insecurity of the day in Nigeria, in Lagos specifically, can make us a little bit more prone to these um, reactions, our environment, even economic insecurities. People are a bit anxious. Where is money going to come from? I want to pay my children's school fees. And then that goes on and people could, could start um, experiencing some things around that. We, um, Mr. Gabriel mentioned examinations and public speaking, like having to give lectures like this. Some of us are students. Some of us are already workers, professionals. You need to make presentations. Just understanding your body, I think, is a good place to start from. When you start experiencing some of those symptoms that he mentioned, then that may just be a lot of anxiety welling up in you. It's not like your heart wants to jump out of your chest, okay? You are normal. 
you are experiencing some anxiety. Now, if that experience continues, aha, uh -huh, and it out, outstrips what is triggering you. For example, um, I'm facing an exam and I just cannot write at all. And I cannot, most of us have anxiety before exams and we, we, we sweat and all, but we get over it. But I completely melt down or I'm, I'm about to stand in front of my, my colleagues and I have a melt, I start crying. Like the man, the person, Mr. Kim Gabriel spoke about trying to rip the boss apart just to escape, you know, then that's an anxiety disorder, probably a panic attack or a panic um, disorder. So the causes could be several, you know, um, then at, at times it's hard to say this is the one cause, but there've been several things that have been connected with um, the risk of anxiety disorders. Now I'm talking about disorders specifically. Genetics plays an important role. We do at times inherit things that our parents have. Um, it has been, research has shown that parents that are anxious oftentimes model the anxiety and at times genetically their children could also be at higher you know risk of having these anxiety disorders and that may well be the cause of anxieties in those individuals so it's not um it's not strange for me at times i'm seeing a child with anxiety symptoms and i'm looking at mom and i see that mom actually is a very anxious mom and no little wonder that this child has an anxiety disorder our environment could also be that i've spoken quite a bit about several things around around that but environment also um with the experience of things like post-traumatic stress disorder something happened in your environment and that triggered what is known as ptsd in, in that individual and the person starts exhibiting anxiety symptoms it could be from that environmental exposure that, that triggered that. Our brain chemistry, as we are, every function that we demonstrate or manifest is a function of chemicals working in our brains, okay? So at times, some research has shown that some faulty circuits in some individuals' brains may be connected to the expression of anxiety disorders. Medication withdrawal or misuse can also um, generate anxiety um, disorders in individuals. And then some medical conditions have either been linked with the manifestation of anxiety disorders or they have symptoms that are similar to anxiety, things like hypertension, you know, or um, thyroid conditions when the thyroid levels are high. They could experience symptoms that look like anxiety disorders. And that's, it's important to mention this because an individual experiencing those symptoms may need to actually get themselves checked out by a clinician to make sure that it's not something else that is causing what they're, what they're doing, um, what, what they're experiencing. You asked about risk factors, you know. Um, at times risk and causations, they, are, they, they somehow, we, we use them interchangeably, but risk is really things that predispose us a little bit more that make us a little bit more at risk of coming up with anxiety disorders. So when you hear risk, for those that are not mental health experts, that's what we're talking about. So a history of mental um, health condition can put a person at risk. For example, it's not unusual to have things like depression and anxiety going hand in hand, you know, being comorbid as we like to call it, or the conditions I've spoken about, the post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress um, disorders could also um, come up with a lot of anxiety symptoms or comorbid anxiety disorder. Childhood sexual ex um, abuse, um, these life events, harsh life events, the way we've been brought up. Remember I linked you with post-traumatic stress disorder, childhood sexual abuse is a trauma that occurred in childhood. And that child could grow up to be an adult that's a little bit more at risk of anxiety disorders, trauma, any kinds of trauma, PTSD, remember I spoke about that. Um, other negative life events could predispose us a little, you know, bit more to this. And, you know, these experiences could be linked to low self-esteem. And because of that, we're a little bit more anxious when we have to, to perform. So I, I think knowing ourselves and also understanding ourselves is a very important first step to, to being able to recognize when things are amiss and be able to reach out for help when it's um, necessary. I think I should pause there. Yes. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Okay. Oh, we'll still come back to you because you, you raised something very vital. And that's the, the, the issue of when, when children have been sexually abused or maybe traumatized and uh, you know, linking it up with 
the, the, the self-esteem thing, and then not being able to now navigate through life. No, that that's, that looks very good. But sometimes you now don't even have history of um, abuse, uh, but, but a child now still have this anxiety issues and other things like that. So I, I will come back to you. We'll go yes. look at um, when the fear persists, even in a child, what can parents do? How can they help? But then um, let me go over to Mr. Aki Gabriel. And no, you, you reeled out earlier on a whole lot of um, symptoms um, or what would map an individual to understand that what they are actually experiencing is anxiety or uh, maybe anxiety disorder. Now we're talking about from normal to uh, abnormal. Um, how, can I, how can I help myself? Before the physician will come in, before the doctor, the psychologist or whoever will be there, how can I help myself? What can I do? How can I make the situation better? Are there tips um, that I can use to help me feel better? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kemi. Yeah, um, of course, um, there are ways that I can actually help myself. And I think the first way is what Dr. Osho mentioned. by saying, be aware, let's be aware of our own body, of our own emotion. Uh, uh, it's our own, it's our own experience. I'm different from the other person. I should be able to, uh, uh, able to uh, uh, be aware and study myself. I know when I'm up or down. And if Whatever results I get from the self-evaluation, I should not panic. So be aware of your body, one, then two. Don't panic of whatever you find. Because, of course, panic, panicking is already setting up the anxiety uh, reaction there. So just be aware, then don't panic. Just in case we have now find out that uh, maybe the, the, uh, the signs, that, uh, including those that I mentioned earlier, are there you cannot begin to do something about it. I mentioned don't panic because in some cases, some people have reported that they, they are afraid, they are worried that they are not anxious. You know, there's a situation on ground, there's an exam coming up, it's a very, very important exam that's coming up. And so it's saying that I have an exam the day after tomorrow, and I'm worried, what are you worried about? I'm worried that I'm not feeling, I'm not anxious about the whole thing. That's the bother for that person. And that's why we're having that discussion. So whatever the case may be, if it's also in the fact that maybe I'm, I have an exam coming up and I'm feeling so anxious, you can do something about it. And that is seeking professional help. It's not just seeking help. It's not just uh, 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 talking to somebody because you could be talking to the wrong person. Some people have a, uh, can I say, a, a default way of dealing with anxiety. And you can just maybe be, uh, uh, go, to that, go to that particular person. For some people, it's just to take, they ask, oh, take this. They give you one substance or the other that they believe will calm all your anxiety. Oh, once you just take this, they're going to be calm. For, for it may meet, meet that need at that particular time, but for actually be the beginning of another problem entirely. So seeking help is seeking professional help for somebody who have uh, ex experienced that particular area. Now, when you now seek help, you, may, you will probably see a uh, a, a, a definitely a mental health worker who is either a psychiatrist or a psychologist. The psychiatrist would, would do some assessments, you know, ask you quite a lot of questions about the history and everything, and eventually perhaps be, be identify what's wrong. And most probably talk to you in terms of counseling and prescribe some medications that will also help you. There are medications that will calm you down, that, that will help in calming down the system, not only calm down, but also treat that condition. You also see a, a psychologist or a counselor who will also help you. Uh, psychologists are actually trained to use some psychological procedures to, the, to, to help you to overcome your anxiety. You know, there, there are several forms of the psychology. There are quite a lot of them. You can't mention all of them there. Uh, uh, beginning from the, what's called the, the, the exposure procedures, which is just basically in some instances, they will just, they just expose you to these sources of uh, anxiety. Oh, that's after making sure that, uh, uh, well, they, 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 you won't go into shock in that particular, they, they have assessed the right level of, uh, before actually exposing to that particular uh, 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 source of phobia. It's not as if they just bring out a snake, for example, if you have a phobia for snake and begin to show it around. No, 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 no. There are uh, procedures for that. But to exposure, there are exposure, both, both physically as well as an in vivo, where you can also do it uh, uh, in vivo. There are also some other procedures as well, including the uh, systematic desensitization. 
which is a stepwise procedure that will uh, uh, that aims to eliminate each level of the fear. There's a way that psychology will help you to break down the levels of this fear and anxiety into what we call hierarchies, and they will uh, assist you to eliminate or de desensitize all the, the, the various levels of those anxiety, and you become free. So the, all of these levels are available and there. So there are so many of them that can. So cognitive behavioral therapy is also one for, uh, for generalized anxiety disorder that are also available. But the most most importantly, of course, is that there are some simple procedures of some things that you can actually just do. Immediately, you feel yourself, uh, you feel uh, the discomfort of anxiety. If I have maybe about two or three minutes, we could talk about breathing exercise. You know, breathing exercise and then be mindful of your breathing. This is more or less like a, more, a, a fast way of actually restoring calmness within the system. The idea is that you know uh, one of the symptoms, one of the signs of anxiety is that difficulty with breathing. The breathing is rapid, and at the same time, breathing is shallow. That's uh, that's suggesting that the amount of oxygen being taken into the system at that particular time is reduced, and so energy and all the other things that the uh, energy uh, that that the oxygen is supposed to do in the system is reduced, especially for the brain. Moreover, uh, the evacuation of carbon dioxide is also reduced. So the idea, the, the thing that there is to help uh, is to get as much oxygen in and get as much of the carbon dioxide out. Carbon dioxide has also been linked to some, uh, to actually uh, uh, pricking some uh, form of anxiety symptoms. So what you can just quickly do is just what there are so many procedures also, but that it's one popular one called the five five seven procedure. That means you have five seconds of uh, breathing in, five seconds of holding it, and then about seven seconds of uh, expelling the carbon dioxide. All you just need to do is just to sit down, you know, comfortably in, this, in, uh, in a comfortable position and drag in as much oxygen as you can to a count of about five. Then you hold it for a count of about five, you know, holding, hold your breath for a count, count of five. Then you now release the breath to a count of about seven. Oh, holding your breath, uh, uh, you need to be careful at that because in some cases, when the anxiety is so intense, some people have reported that, that they have difficulty holding their breath. So if you actually just do breathe five, seven, that's it, you breathe into a count of five, breathing as much oxygen as possible, then you breathe out the, uh, uh, the count of seven and escape the holding in until you are sure that, that this person will actually uh, uh, hold his or her breath. Because if it's the person who needs a panic attack, the person might almost want to choke if you want to hold uh, the breath. So you don't want to do that. So it, once you're able to do about for, uh, five to 10 minutes of the breathing exercises deliberately. After, after that, just go into the breathing and uh, uh, breathing procedure without holding your breath. Just breathe in deeply and expel as much as possible. There's something we call reciprocal inhibition. Two opposite feelings can exist at the same time. You can't, you can't feel anxious and calm at the same time. Deep breathing will calm you down. When you are calm, you can't have any form of anxiety. So these are some of the things that you can actually do when you find yourself that having anxiety. Thank you very much, Kemi. Thank you so very much, Captain. I, I'm sure that, uh, don't mind me, sorry, I called him Captain on here now. That's, that's <laughs> what we'll call you basically in the office, or Mr. K. Gabriel. Um, um, thank you, Dr. Oshodi, for responding to some of the questions on the platform. Uh, I was going to take you up on some of those questions that um, have been asked. Um, and I would also love, like I said, when, when fear persists in a child, um, you know, this anxiety has just become, it's, no, it's not age appropriate. Like you talked about the normative pain earlier on. Um, what can parents do? How can they help a child without necessarily coming to the hospital first of all? Uh, so what can they do? How can we help that child to be able to deal with all of those things? And then we will also take up a whole lot of um, questions. Uh, thank you so much. I know Dr. Oshodi has been responding to you. Um, and like you said, this is the first point of call, talking about it. Yes, you're aware, and then you're talking about it. Then the next step will be to come in and you know, be thoroughly assessed. Um, th th there can be a, a lot of intervention that will be done on this platform. That you have to be assessed properly and um, the right thing has to be done. So, but thank you so very much for opening up and talking about this. Dr. Oshodi, over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, the, for the earlier question and, you know, the, a few other ones that have come up. So, um, you know, so when we think about children and infants, very, from very early on, you can already tell that temperaments of our babies are different 
from infancy. Some babies are a little bit more needy, they're a bit more fussy, some cry a bit more. So you can already almost like um, have a, a, a feel of the difference in outlook to experiences. So I agree with you that some children very early on um, may have anxiety disorders, not just the normal anxiety symptom. Like I said, the door slamming is normal and a baby screams, um, strangers coming in and a baby cries and doesn't want to be carried, that's normal. But the way you now have something in excess, which there are, there are clear criteria for making um, diagnosis of anxiety disorders. I think something that parents can begin to do from very early is to first of all, improve their parenting skills. At times there are things that we, we do as parents that are not helpful and we don't intend to cause any harm, but unfortunately at times parents do um, do that. For example, um, Ojuju is coming to catch you, all those kinds of things. I don't know what benefit that is, you know, to, to the development of a child, you know, and uh, what we're doing is we're reinforcing fear in them. Remember they are learning theories, they are learning processes. The more you do something, you're consistent, then you're aiding, in short, you're endorsing certain reactions and unfortunately aging and abating if I could use that. And that's the simplest of, of um, things, you know. Um, if we are traumatizing our children, we don't mean harm, but we say it's corporal punishment, you know, and we're beating them over, you know, and there, there's one thing to punish and discipline. There's another thing to be dangerous and harmful. And what we're doing is creating trauma, creating the cycle of trauma, in that child. The other thing is we need to also be aware, that's why I said we need to learn. This, this, this session may not be enough for all the learnings. When you think about um, resilience, how do we build resilience in our children? How they're facing challenging situations and we've taught them with skill of how to do that. A regular parent may struggle if they have never known about this before. So that may be another learning Thing that parents need to need to do. Okay, I noticed that my child is a bit more withdrawn and all that. What can I do to help? Read up on it. Ask questions. Talk to mental health experts. Your child may not necessarily have a disorder, but when you parents are right, you may strengthen that child's capacity and build a bit more, you know, um, confidence. Now, there are some children. Remember, I said temperaments that are naturally shy. They're shy children, their temperaments right from, there's no trauma, nothing, they're just shy. Now, these may be children that may grow up to be at risk of things like, you know, social anxiety disorders and stuff like that. It's not that you've done anything wrong as a parent, it's just that the makeup of that child, um, you know, makes them a bit more at risk and they, they may end up becoming older children, older adolescents and young adults with anxiety disorders. So someone asked in the chat about genetics, you know, um, I'm not. I, I'm not going to be able to reel out. Okay, it's this gene, this gene, and this gene that is linked to the anxiety disorders. But I can just say generally that there has been research that shows that there are some genetic um, um, correlations with certain anxiety disorders. You know, in certain individuals, so genes do play. Um, a very important role. And th that is distinct from the modeling I spoke about where we're anxious as moms and our children are watching us and they're learning to be anxious. That's quite separate. The genetic risk is a thing on its own. And then learning, learned behaviors are also play a role also. Thank you. All right, thank you so very much, Dr. Oshodi. I remember all our life, it was Ojuju. They will call Ojuju Kalaba. And so even in your head, you would start to imagine how does the Ojuju lose? We cannot define it, but we know. In my, we have built up a wall to begin to imagine. And even now, you can imagine that, uh, you no, know, it's just it's just, it's just, just still there sometimes in our mind when Nepa takes mm -hmm. like, and the next thing mm -hmm. is, you know, the, you know that feel, it just comes automatically. You know, there is a conditioning that has gone on. And so thank you so very much. And then I'm going to, there are a couple of questions you have answered that about um, um, the genetic thing, but constant nightmare, can it trigger constant anxiety as well as can anxiety trigger asthma and respiratory issues? Let me just take that out for us. Okay, so constant nightmare triggering constant anxiety. I, maybe I'll, I'd want to say it's the other way around. Anxiety may trigger the nightmares, you understand? So the child may be anxious and then they're having nightmares because often what we're experiencing in our dreams a reflection of either things we've been through or things we're apprehensive about or things that are really in our subconscious, you know, so that it may actually be a reflection of some other 
kind of, you know, um, uncertainty that that child is, you know, experiencing that may need to be explored around to, to help. The second one was what something about um, asthma, asthma and respiratory, um, how does it say? As can anxiety trigger asthma and respiratory issues? Um, I'll say that they can coexist. They can, they can be side by side. And indeed, you know, I, I would also say maybe more the other way around. Patients that do have anxiety attacks and asthma, asthmatic episodes may be a bit prone to, you know, to anxieties. And when anxieties become overwhelming, we can also have triggers of asthmatic attacks going on. Because remember, with anxiety, you're already hyperventilating, you're breathing fast, your heart is beating fast. And, you know, so I, I think it can be bi directional the relationship okay um i think those are the two that you you threw at me but please can i just add one or two things concerning um concerning how we manage and i i like what mr aki gabriel did also by teaching us you know little things that we can do i think being some self-help tips can always be it's never too much things that you can even do on your own, learning about stress management, attending sessions around this can be helpful so that you can also become somewhat in control of your normal anxieties. You have a presentation, you're hyperventilating, learn how to do those things that Mr. Gabriel has said, avoid things like caffeine, you know, that could also worsen some of the symptoms. Some people, when they take coffee, they get so anxious. So just observe, is it connected to what you're experiencing? If it is, then maybe coffee is not you know, for you. Um, in some settings, there are support groups that can also be helpful, but Mr. Aki put out a provisio and um, a, a warning and said, make sure you're getting help from the right places so that we're not connecting with people that are not trained in this area, formal training, so that you're you are getting the right, the, the right help. So support groups can be helpful also, whether in person or online, it's been shown to be almost as um, as effective. It's, so it doesn't necessarily even have to be face to face. It can be, you know, virtual. So I just wanted to add to add that, of course, apart from learning and knowing yourself, being self-aware, what are the things that make me feel like this? Hmm. Observe it, then you know, okay, it seems that when I'm in this setting, I react this way. Maybe I can try one or two things to help calm me down. And that may be all you need. You may never even need to see um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but if that fails, you know, and it's a lot more than what one can manage, one should and must seek help on time. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, Mr. Kigabel, can you just quickly take this? Can a parent who is authoritarian affect the child from having anxiety disorders, such as having panic disorder um, at home or outside the family environment, the parenting style, um, can it cause or predispose a child to having anxiety disorder? Sure. Thank you very much, Kemi. Uh, a short thing, um, Dr. Shud has mentioned the, um, the, the issue with parenting. Parenting styles definitely have uh, a way of, of starting up anxiety uh, within the children. Um, of course, we've, we've heard of some children, whenever they, they hear about daddy's car, um, round, rounding up the corner, maybe the horn or something, they take off. Not only taking off, taking that taking off is the final result, but there's there's this palpitation, there's sweat, there's all sort of restlessness and total disorganization of the system, which eventually not uh, end by just taking off to their room or wherever as that is coming up. So that could actually be if it's not dealt with on time, if it's not corrected, if the parenting style is not looked into, it could actually cause uh, quite a lot of things. But quickly, can I, I I just quickly respond to or make a comment about? Uh, and your last uh, observation there. Uh, well, uh, let me see say that, and you are not alone uh, in that area. I, I want to believe there's a particular gentleman who's also on this platform listening to these uh, uh, conversations right now. He had a similar case. This gentleman escaped having a, a heart operation done on, his, on himself, all because of anxiety. He has been having palpitation. He has been going here and there, and he's been, you know, he's been diagnosed with quite a lot of heart-related uh, uh, diagnosis. He has bags of medication that he carries around all the time. He has, he has to take morning, afternoon, and evening, some certain hours. He was carrying them around, and he wasn't getting well. 
the, the symptoms were actually worsening until a particular time, maybe after months of uh, you know of, of that, if someone now told me what you need to do, you need to carry out an operation on your heart in in Lagos here. So when I felt that ah okay, of course you can imagine that added up to the whole anxiety. And uh, it, his family decided that instead of having this operation done here, done here in Lagos, why can't you, let's go and do it outside. And they went outside, you know, uh, out of the country. You know, it was there. During the initial uh, uh, initial assessment, I found out that, okay, uh, have you ever uh, seen a mental health worker? He, he told me that he was actually, uh, not if they were questioning his uh, mental health. And he actually told me that he said, it appears that he might have an advice reading. And he advised him. He came back without having the operation done, and it's alive and doing very well today. The 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 the, the diagnosis and all what we are treating is just basically an anxiety-related condition. So a lot of people have that type of, uh, uh, condition, but may not know what is going on, and that's why we are having this conversation. So in Allah, you can pop in at any time according to what my medical director's advice, and this way we can actually receive some help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mr. King Gabriel. Um, there's a question for Josephine now that says, I'm not too sure they wanted to think that. Is there any relationship between intense anger and anxiety? I know someone who, when very angry, becomes anxious to the point of sleeplessness. Hmm. Okay, um, it's, it's, I, I will not be able to categorically diagnose this person based on that limited information. But what I can say is that when a person has overwhelming anger to a point where they cannot control it, then they need some help. It could be several things contributing to it. And um, anxious anxiety symptoms could coexist with whatever else is causing it. I'll just say that we need to, as individuals ourselves, and as people that are related to other people, connected with other people, gradually destigmatize the need to access mental health support. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask for clarity. It's okay to just pop in and say, you know what, I think I'm fine, but I just want to double check. I'm going through this, 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 and this, and see a mental health expert and just have things looked at. I don't think it's ever too much. And I know we're in a community and environment that there's a lot of stigma, but the reduction of stigma starts with you and I, it starts with us, you know, for some people, it's easier to have a step down. You want to see a psychologist privately. That's fine if it works for you. Maybe you are too scared to enter the neuropsychiatry hospital or to come to psychiatry department or lose. But either way, get help. And Yola made a comment about the poor psychological services in the country. I beg to differ. And I'd want to please correct that. I apologize if you've experienced bad treatment in any way. There are loads of wonderful um, clinicians that are properly trained and very professional still in this country doing amazing work. And many of them are on this platform as we speak. So Eniola, if you are with a therapist, it's not working, you're also free to change your therapist. And there'll be that one that fits. There's usually what we call a fit, a right fit between the patient and the mental health care provider. If it doesn't fit, it may just not be you or the clinician, it's just not a good fit and you find that fit. And please don't lose confidence. Let's reach out. I'm not sure I answer that question clearly. I'm just saying that person needs to be assessed properly. Thank you. That's a very good one. Thank you so very much for that beautiful response. Um, Emmanuel Yehe says, what causes brain fog? You read and go into the exams and you forget everything. But once you leave the exam hall, everything starts to play in your head like a radio. One minute, Mr. Aki, one minute, just take that one minute and then we'll start rounding up. We mentioned that earlier as well, you know, um, just going blank at that at such period could actually be, be uh, amongst others, could actually be part of the sign of uh, symptom, the brain fog uh, syndrome. You know, there's this preparation and then the anxiety has set in so much that, that it disrupted the whole process of uh, assimilating and uh, doing the right thing. And of course, it will be as a result of the anxiety, a heightened up at that particular time. And of course, go just blank. Nothing. Best thing is just to just let go, calm down, try and calm down, relax, and give it a go again. 
All right, thank you so very much. Um, we're going to take last um, comment from our speakers, but before we do that, I just want to quickly just run through what we have on the platform. Yes, the thank you messages are there. We appreciate everyone also for being on this call. Um, and your last days, learning plays a big role. If it can be learned, then it can be online. And that's why we're having this um, platform to you know, share information like this. But some of the ways we had trained, some of the ideas and the belief you know, that we have over the years that have not helped us. There are things that we can also begin to relearn look at and adjust appropriately, um, you know, so that we can become better individuals. Um, Dr. Mustafa Tori Isombe said, thanks, Dr. Shodi Peretti, skills required to be aced up. Yeah, I quite agree with you, especially with what we have now. Um, and your line, I know that you have been addressed. The numbers of the Urban Voice, the helpline have been sent on the platform. And so you can reach out to us and then we will be here and willing to help and to work with you until we're able to get a solution to all of these uh, things. Um, yes, so thank Thank you, thank you so very much for everyone. We're going to just take the last word uh, from our speakers on this thing, anxiety, from normal to abnormal. Thank you so very much, everyone, again, once again. Dr. Oshodi, yes, let's hear from you. Last word, well, ma'am. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to all the participants and for you know all the questions. It's been a really lovely morning or afternoon now. I'll just leave us with a few points. Let us all be self-aware. Self-awareness is a skill and it actually helps you take your power back. You are now in control. Be aware what's going on with you. You, you start breathing, sweating and all that under certain circumstances, recognize it, and then you can target solutions towards it, either by learning or reading or seeing an expert, okay? So learning is the next thing. Be self-aware, number one, learn what to do, number two, and then seek help, number three. When what you have done, it's still not helping, okay? Then lastly, when you do get help, please, please, please comply. Comply with the help and the guidance you've been given. If you've been taught exercises, practice them, use them. If you've been given medications, please comply with them and always give your clinicians feed feedback. And I know that we'll all continue to remain mentally healthy. There's no health without mental health. Without mental Thank health. you very much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Shady. Mr. Akin Gabriel, can we have the last word from you, sir? That's what I would take too. Uh, be, let's be aware of our mental health. Uh, you are not queer. You are not strange. You are just unique. Uh, you are not me. You are different from everybody. You are unique. It's not being queer or you no know, like that. So but if if you observe anything about you, check it out. Ask questions from uh, uh, from the right person, from the right professional. Don't let's be ashamed. Let's remove all the shame uh, in mental health and get help. It is possible that you can get help. It is possible. You are not alone if you are having any of these symptoms, any of these conditions, and there are procedures. There is help that is available for you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, because they, we are so, so, so better informed. Uh, and we, we are grateful that you obliged us and you had made it a duty to be here to also share um, in, in, from the world of experience with us. I also want to appreciate everyone also who have been on this call with us today. Uh, we're so grateful. Each time we could roll out like this, you all come. And this makes it very, very unique and beautiful for us. You know, it makes us to also want to go and look at what else can we do? How else can we make it better? Uh, so thank you. Thank you so very much for motivating us on always. What our speakers have said, and they had both agreed in their last statement, is self-awareness is key. Learning is important. You must seek help, and then you must also comply even with the help that is being given out. If you don't comply, then it's wasted and it's not even going to be effective. And that's what I am taking home from all of these um, today. So thank you so very much from, uh, for everyone who have been here. Please note that we'll be coming again next, April, um, next month, which is April, and it's going to be a big one. Let me just whisper what we have for you. Spousal abuse. Now, it is not against women. It is against men. Somebody says, wow, does, wow, it, happen? does it happen? Oh, oh excuse, excuse me. me. It, it does. does. And it's so, so, so much in the literature, literature now. now. You will be surprised at the the level of privilege and men who are coming down with this thing and it's affecting them psychologically the, the, the number of presentation had increased and then again i'm going to ask you a, a question for every woman here are you not abusing your spouse come and learn let's go and learn so that we know that those things that we are doing is it right is it wrong can we make it better and how can we adjust and how can men seek help you can imagine a man going up and saying my wife is beating me it's not done it's never heard of also most times they wouldn't even come out to start looking at it. All right, so we are looking at spousal abuse.
views against men nestor and on behalf of the medical director dr lubenga dekile Oweye, the head of clinicals and every member of the yabo voice team i want to say thank you to everyone for being on this call with us thank you to our presenters for being here please do have a lovely day and enjoy a sound mental health bye-bye thank, thank you, you so much. very bye -bye. much bye, -bye. bye, -bye.